Tuesday morning in the dark, I was finding out who you are. Rish. Hey, Rish. What? Hey, sit down at the microphone, man. It's time to podcast. What, what are you talking about? We already recorded the skippable part of the show. Yeah, I know, but it's November now. So? We need to record the uh, October Scary Story conversation. The what? You know, where you make up the silly, stupid, slightly insulting story concepts that people supposedly sent into the show. That, right. <gasps> what? Oh, no. What's wrong? You're as white as a senator. I, f- I forgot to do it. You forgot to write up idiotic story ideas to make fun of? Oh, no, 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 no! Dude, calm down. It's no big deal. No big deal? I blew it, man! I've totally blown it! So you forgot to write something. It's really not such a... <laughs> Don't sugarcoat it, man! I failed you! I failed announcer, man! I, I failed Nicole! Come on, Rich. I failed Kevin Anderson! I failed Liz Jasmierski! I failed Colin Jacobs! But worst of all, I failed Kendall Marchman! Dude, I assure you, none of those people is in any way disappointed. <laughs> they, they're not? No, they don't care about your little sketches. They don't? Heck no. Most people hit skip before the author's note is even through. They do? Rish, nobody gives an elephant's taint about our little comedy bits. And absolutely nobody will be disappointed if we don't have one. They won't? No. They don't think they're funny. They don't think you're funny. And they don't consider it worth their time. They don't? They wouldn't even care if this were our last episode. If we stopped podcasting altogether, if you were hit by a garbage truck and hospitalized with only machinery keeping you alive. They wouldn't? And and if somebody plugged in a hairdryer next door and shorted out the power for just a moment, but it was enough to flip off your respirator, finally releasing you to a cold, lonely death, there's absolutely nobody who would care. You're not just saying that, are you? Honest to Joss Whedon, dude. Wow, I never thought of it like that. Wait, pre-Dollhouse or post-Dollhouse Whedon? Pre? Think Astonishing X-Men, Joss Whedon. Thanks, dude. You really know how to put things into perspective. You're welcome, man. You feeling better, then? About the sketch? Yes, a lot better. Put her there, pal! Uh. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Bo Shuda. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Ah, 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 ah. Oh, oh, oh. Volume 2, number 1, page 40. I am your excellent host, Rish Outfield. And I'm the slightly less excellent, Big Anklevich. And this week, a special appearance by Announcer Man. I think Rish is right. Thanks for coming in. Cheers, guys. Hey, whoa, 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 hey, where are you going? See you guys later. I'm going for a smoke break. I wasted the whole special appearance thing on him. Well, he'll be back to say a couple more inane things later, I'm sure. We dropped Abby Hilton from the show because, you know, it was his special week and now he's gone. Oh, well. He doesn't need to smoke. So the story in today's episode is Working Holiday by Aidan Doyle and Colin Jacobs. Aidan Doyle is an Australian writer, computer programmer, and a teacher. Aidan recently returned to Australia after teaching English in Japan for four years. He loves traveling and has visited more than 50 countries. He is a Clarion South graduate and his website is words.aidandoyle.net. Colin Jacobs, on the other hand, is by day the proprietor of an Australia-based software development company, but by night defends the rights of Australian internet users as an activist for Electronic Frontiers Australia. Australia, 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 we, we love, love you. you. Amen? Amen. Oh, you tricked me. Although he now spends more time writing about internet policy than writing humorous science fiction, he hopes this won't always be the case. Colin lives in Melbourne, Australia, with a robot named Socrates. Oh, wait, O.T., do you know Socrates? Oh, he says he does. Really? Do you go way back? Nudge, nudge, know what I mean, know what I mean? He says there's been times. (laughs) I bet he has, I bet he does. 
Working Holiday was originally published in 2002 in Australian Absurdities, an Australian anthology of humorous science fiction. We'd also like to uh, send a special shout out of thanks to Josh Roseman, Nicole Suddeth, and Bennett Jackson for lending their voices to this episode. Working Holiday by Aidan Doyle and Colin Jacobs. Six planets in nine days. That's what the brochure had promised. The tour had proved less than enjoyable. Jack despised his fellow travelers. He had constantly argued with the cannibal from the Mars colony, resulting in a warning that he was going to find himself on the wrong end of a four-course banquet. A tour of Andrella's famous wildlife preserve had revealed nothing more than a single swamp rat. And to top it all off, the ship's robot bartender made a lousy cocktail. Jack put his bag on the conveyor belt and kept a close watch as it trundled through the x-ray machine. Wiping the sweat from his hands, Jack stepped up to the customs official. Do you have anything to declare, sir? No. The official opened Jack's bag and examined the contents. Jack had only reserved a place on the tour because he thought a member of a chartered tour group would attract less attention than a single traveler. His hand strayed toward his mouth, where his cyanide tooth waited. The official moved aside some thermal underwear, revealing a plasma rifle. Going hunting, are we, sir? Uh, yes. The official scratched himself, looking skeptical. You'll be hard-pressed to stop a claw fiend with this gun. I'd suggest another megawatt, at least. But it's your funeral. I'll keep that in mind. Jack maintained a strained smile. Do you have any pornographic music in your possession? Artificial sweeteners? I don't think so. The official nodded. Good enough for me. He looked at Jack's identidisc, and then up at Jack. Ever been to Theronia before? No. Jack lied. Be sure to check out the Great Swamp while you're here. That's where you'll find the best claw fiends. The official waved him on. Have a nice stay. <sighs> Jack breathed a sigh of relief and hurried on his way. The official's slackness surprised him. Perhaps they were already on to him and were letting him pass so they could discover the identity of his contacts. While the other members of the tour group were going through customs, Jack surveyed his surroundings. The spaceport was overflowing with tourists, most of them humans coming to visit Theronia. The leader of Theronia seemed to be of the opinion that he was photogenic. The walls were covered in posters bearing his image. There were photos of the decider on the beach, the decider pointing to the geyser in the Great Swamp, the decider opening a stray animal shelter. Except for the ornate uniform, the decider looked like any Theron might, a little over four feet tall, eyes widely spaced, covered in wiry fur, a roguish smile. Almost cute. But Jack knew a Theron's appearance could be deceptive. Other posters displayed warning messages. Tourists are advised not to travel alone at night. There's been a rise in the number of forced income redistributions. A smiling Theron waddled towards Jack. Can't be too careful, eh? May I recommend you use the latest model ultra-secure Implanto wallet? No more fears about pickpockets. The thief would have to open up your abdominal cavity to get his hands on your valuables. No, thank you. Jack hurried to the main exit. The tour leader assembled the group and led the way out of the spaceport and onto the streets of the capital. Jack steeled himself to cope with scenes of grim poverty, but he was surprised that the majority of Therans appeared affluent and well-fed. But Jack knew to look below the surface of this sunny tourist mecca. Sure, the natives were wearing designer clothes, but they were suffering on the inside. Then he saw the mirrored glass dome bearing the sign, Behavior Testing Center Number 12. Uniformed Therans were leading a column of children inside the building. Finally, a true indication of the horrific oppression the Therans endured. Attention please. 
the tour leader called. I'd like you to meet someone. A Theron in a bright green uniform stepped forward, an insignia on his uniform indicating he was a captain in the secret police. Hi, I'm Kedaz. I'll be your secret policeman while you're here on Theronia. If you have any problems or need anything, don't worry. I'll be right behind you. I don't like the sound of that, Mrs. Wilmot said. Both she and her husband were at the top of Jack's list of people he wished would get trapped in a spacecraft's outer airlock. Mr. Wilmot claimed he was a war veteran simply because he had continued paying tax during the Earth-Mars War. Mrs. Wilmot frequently delayed the group to tip the native wildlife. She glared at the Theron. What's the point in telling us you're going to be following us? The policeman shrugged. It's expected. I'm led to believe it makes your trip more exciting. Mr. Wilmot turned to look at the tour guide. I hope we're not being charged extra for this. No, sir. It's all part of the package. The tourist murmured their approval. Join the revolution, sir? A Theron dressed in a brightly colored poncho waved a pamphlet in front of Jack. He felt his heart skip a beat. Surely the revolutionaries wouldn't contact him in such a brazen and open manner. Uh, Excuse me? He finally managed to stammer. The alien handed him the pamphlet. Join the next revolution in fashion! Jack looked at the brochure. It was an advertisement for a clothing store. The prices are so low, you'll think we must be communists! The Theron smiled and moved on to the next group of tourists. The tour group was booked into the Winbig Hotel and Casino Complex. As Jack waited in the lobby for the elevator to arrive, he watched Mr. Wilmot argue with the hotel manager. The decider stopped the ritual, sir. The hotel manager explained. They just seemed a lot of effort to go through. Why go out dancing under the light of the moon when you can stay inside with a warm bottle of old Theronia fermented milk and watch a moderately censored erotic film? That's not good enough, Mr. Wilmot responded. My wife and I paid good money to go on this trip, and we expect to take part in authentic Theronian dancing rituals. The manager hesitated and then said, I'm sure we can arrange a ritual especially for you and your lovely wife. He called over his assistant. Mr. and Mrs. Wilmot are interested in taking part in our special dancing rituals. Is that right? The assistant manager was all smiles. Jack turned his attention back to the elevator display panel. A glowing neon sign informed him of the size of the jackpot prize available if he tried his luck at video poker. Earth had conquered Theronia for this? So tourists could wipe out the last traces of Theron culture by staying in tacky casinos? Jack had been a soldier in the Terran military when Earth had overthrown the Belshadri, the previous rulers of this planet. At the time, Jack had thought that Earth was liberating the Therans from their Belshadri conquerors, but he saw one master swiftly replaced with another. Once the Belshadri opposition had been defeated, the battalion in which Jack served had been sent to ensure the Therans did not resist. The conflict had been all too swift, the Therans overwhelmed by the might of the Terran military. Jack had returned to make amends for the part he played on that dark day. It had taken Jack a long time to work up the courage to leave his old life behind and return to Theronia. He tried a few small gestures of rebellion on Earth, but they had proved largely ineffectual. The only response his free Theronia petition had elicited was an autographed photo of the Terran president. What do you mean we're not allowed to wear any clothes to the ritual? Mr. Wilmot's whining voice filtered over to Jack as he stepped inside the elevator. Congratulations, Mr. Taylor. A female voice sounded as he entered the lift. You're the 100th person to ride this elevator today. Please enter your guest ID on the keypad to authorize the removal of a small fee from your bank account. Then you will be awarded a special mystery prize. Jack pressed his floor number. A siren started to sound. This is a courtesy reminder that you have not yet entered your guest ID. The voice continued. If you want to collect your prize, you will have to enter your ID. Jack gritted his teeth. The siren increased in volume.
It looked a lot less slimy in the brochure, Mrs. Wilmot said. They were standing on one of the viewing platforms overlooking the great swamp. The brown-green water stretched for miles. Beneath them, a dimly lit tunnel led underneath the swamp. We can get a much better look at the swamp, and in particular the geyser, by traveling through the viewing tunnel. However, due to recent construction, the air in the tunnel isn't breathable. The tour leader pointed to a smiling Theron who was standing at a booth nearby. Ebgeek has kindly agreed to supply us with breathing equipment for only a minimal price. Mr. Wilmot opened his mouth to speak, but the tour guide held up her hand. This isn't included in your fee. Unfortunately, this will cost you extra. Mr. Wilmot stared at the board listing the conditions for hiring breathing equipment. These prices are outrageous, he complained. Ibgik smiled apologetically. Well, oxygen is out of season. Mr. Wilmot glared at him. What do you mean? Oxygen doesn't grow on trees, you know, Ibgik replied. Now look here, Mr. Wilmot began. The tour leader intervened. Those of you who don't want to enter the viewing tunnel are welcome to wait here. Jack took the opportunity to break away from the main tour group. He had arranged to meet his contacts here. He worked his way back to the car park. There was a strange collection of vehicles there. Humans had restricted the level of technology available to the Therans. Early 21st century Earth technology mixed with pieces that had been allowed by the Terran Trade Commission. Jack noticed two Therans sitting on scooters, trying to look inconspicuous. He walked over to them. Are you Jack Taylor? Jack nodded. I'm Greta, and this is Alba, one of the Therans said. He focused his gaze on something behind Jack. You were followed here. Jack turned to look and saw a Theron dressed in the bright green uniform of the secret police. Fascist scum! Greffa shouted. The policeman waved back. It's all right. It's only kiddos, Alba said. Greffa glared at Alba. I don't think you should be fraternizing with the enemy. Ah, but I thought you said we should know our enemy, Alba countered, looking pleased. I don't think that extends to playing poker with them, Greffa said. What are we going to do now? Jack asked. We'll go back to our headquarters, Greffa replied. What about the policeman? We just have to wait for a suitable diversion, Greffa said. It shouldn't be too long till your tour group comes out of the viewing platform near the geyser. There's always one who goes a bit too close. They waited for a few minutes, and then they heard screams of someone shrieking. Ah! Ah! It's burning me! The policeman rushed towards the viewing tunnel, and the revolutionaries smiled at Jack. Let's go. The revolutionaries' headquarters was a grimy apartment. Lumps of thick brown fur were scattered over the furniture, and the walls were covered with x-rays of different parts of the Theron anatomy. Are you studying the best way to kill our opponents? Jack asked. Pressure points and so on. Alba looked a bit bashful. Greffa snorted. He's studying for a medical exam. His place is always cluttered up with his books. Ah. Jack focused his attention on a sheet of paper hanging on the wall. It listed a series of times, all in 15-minute intervals. These must be the times when the decider's guard changes, and he's at his most vulnerable. Alba looked even more embarrassed. Actually, they're the times when hot water is available in the building. Jack brushed aside the fur and sat down on the couch. The two Therans sat down on either side of him. Finally, we can learn the truth about the war, Greffa said. You were there. Tell us everything that happened. It must have been horrible. It was, Jack agreed. A tragedy. Tell us about the firebombing of civilians, prompted Greffa. I hear it happened all the time. Christ, yes, replied Jack. At least, I remember bombing a factory, but I seem to recall it was already on fire when we got there. We may actually have put it out, now that I come to think of it. Besides, the factory only produced lawn furniture, hardly a military target. There must have been hundreds of innocents tortured, politicals and so on. I do remember a lot of children being forced to stay indoors during the hostilities. And the day of the invasion was a very sunny one. Yeah, that can be rough, being stuck inside on a sunny day. Yeah, if you're a kid. Sure, 
Rafa looked around the room as if casting for ideas. Lutein? One of my men stole a packet of chewing gum. Mm Mm-hmm. Although he did steal it from one of the vending machines on our troop transport. Right, right. Still, you know. Yeah. War. Jack shrugged uncomfortably. Um... Eventsless pats being tramped underfoot. Rafa suggested. Yes, agreed Jack. Then he looked uncertain. I think our assault pod may have touched down on a rabbit hutch. They were silent for a moment. Then Greffa nodded slowly. Bunny squashing is nothing to sneer at. I'm glad my generation has been spared that kind of horror. He patted Jack sympathetically on the back. I feel for you, man. War is hell. Hmm, Jack said. Somehow, he felt rather dissatisfied. So, what have you been doing to help liberate the planet? We've been riding public transport without paying, Alba said. For a while, we were urinating on the seats of public toilets. But that part of our campaign of dissent wasn't so favorably received, Greffa added. He climbed off the couch and fetched a pile of papers. We've already written a declaration of war. And last week, we conducted some more crimes trials. We found the decider guilty in absentia and sentenced him to house arrest. Uh, house arrest? Well, it's the principle of the thing, Alba said. Well, haven't you ever heard of the phrase, death to tyrants? Mm, that was before we started watching the decider show. The, the what? The decider show. It's a sitcom starring the decider. Trust me, when he gets that look in his eyes and says, And for this I run the planet, your heart melts. <laughs> Alba and Greffa chuckled to themselves. Jack shook his head in exasperation. It doesn't sound as though you've made a lot of progress. Be fair, Greffa protested. Revolution's a lot of hard work. Alba's been busy with his medical studies, and I've been writing my thesis on a critical postmodern analysis of the patriarchal overlord compulsion in an attempt to better understand our species' identity. Well, I'm I'm sure that will help, Jack said. But what about the rest of the revolutionary movement? Alba looked downcast. We've had a few desertions lately. Ever since the decider abolished income tax, it's been harder to recruit more comrades. The literacy programs, the health reforms, the trade unions. None of this does much to help our campaign to highlight his tyranny. Alba paused and scratched himself. Fur flew across the room. Do you have to do that? Jack protested. Alba shrugged. It's in our genes. You can't go against genetics, you know. Jack sighed. (sighs) Do you have anything to drink? He asked. Of course. Alba waddled over to the fridge and returned with a glass of a thick white liquid. Let's drink to the revolution. What is this? Jack asked. Fermented milk. Jack held the glass up and sniffed it suspiciously. (laughs) What kind of milk? Remember the Great Swamp? Well... Never mind. Jack had had worse during his time in the army. He choked it down. So how did you get involved in the revolution? I was in the armed forces, Greffa said. I discovered they were using us as test subjects for their experimental weapons program. They shrunk my genitals. Excuse me? They put a chemical in my breakfast cereal and it reduced the size of my genitals. Albus shook his head. Don't listen to Greffa. He's always had small genitals. I have not. Look, I'll prove it. Albus shook his head. I'm not measuring them again. Jack interrupted their argument. I've been thinking about what I've seen on Theronia. And to be honest, I haven't really seen much evidence that the decider is as brutal a leader as you seem to want to make him out to be. Greffa hesitated and then said, We'll give you a demonstration of how merciless the secret police are. He pointed to the window. Keep an eye on that window. He scuttled over to the door and left the apartment. Alba waddled over to the window. Jack followed him over. They watched as Greffa emerged onto the street and entered the public phone box. Who is he calling? Jack asked. Wait and see. As they watched, 
Graffa left the phone box and hurried back inside the apartment block. He entered the apartment and pointed back at the window. Keep watching. A police vehicle painted in a pale blue pastel color pulled up in front of the house opposite the apartment block. The car doors opened and two police officers went and knocked on the door. A Theron in yellow pants opened the door, scratching lazily. He was led to the car while the other officers went inside and brought out his mate. I reported our neighbors as communists, Greffa said. You can see what sort of regime we're living under. They didn't even get a trial. <sighs> Jack sighed and sat down on the couch. He was so tired he didn't bother to clean the fur on the seat. He felt dizzy. The swamp milk must have been stronger than he realized. He closed his eyes, and as he drifted off to sleep, he heard the revolutionaries arguing again. Now you see here. Less than three, but more than one. They were drafting the constitution of their new state and were disputing the number of iced confectionery desserts per meal unit each citizen was entitled to. Oh, I don't know, Fred. Yes, but this is just to There There's six meals a day, right? If you're expecting someone to eat 20 wait, desserts... Wait, 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 uh... Oh, oh, oh. <coughs> when Jack woke... His head felt as though it had been subject to exploratory digging by an overzealous mining robot. Both of the revolutionaries were slumped at their tables. Jack decided he was going to have to rely on his own skills. He staggered back to the hotel and spent the day going through combat exercises. When night fell, he checked his plasma rifle and set out towards the decider's palace. For a trained Terran commando, bypassing the security systems at the decider's palace was easier than downloading Xenoporn from the interstellar computer network. Jack was soon walking down the corridor leading to the decider's personal chambers. A Theron soldier wearing blast-proof body armor stood in front of the door. He seemed half asleep. Jack took out a length of piano wire. Think back to training, he told himself as he wound the wire around one hand. The soldier yawned and looked around. Oh, hello there, he said cheerfully. He undid his top button and exposed his neck. I expect you'd be wanting to crush my windpipe then. Jack stopped in horror. This must be a cunning plan to make him lower his guard. The soldier smiled and opened the door. No need for any grotting. Go right in. He gestured for Jack to enter. Ah, come in, Commander Taylor. The decider was waiting inside. I've been expecting you. Jack stood frozen in surprise for a few seconds then dropped into a combat crouch, keeping his focus on the decider. The Theron's medals sparkled in the subdued, tasteful lighting in the chamber. Drink, perhaps, the decider continued. Mineral water? Fermented swamp milk? No, thank you. Jack reviewed his training, trying to remember the correct response to being offered a refreshing beverage by one's enemy. He decided screaming and rushing at the decider with a knife between his teeth would be an appropriate ad hoc response. Before he could respond, the decider flicked a small switch, and relaxing Muzak filled the chamber. Jack blinked in bewilderment. Here, let me take that for you, said the decider, and reached out for Jack's rifle. Jack held his finger on the trigger and hesitated. All he needed to do was twitch, and the decider would have to be pumped into his coffin. The decider grasped the rifle with one hand, and held out a fizzy drink in the other. Jack relinquished his grip on the gun and took the proffered drink. The decider rested Jack's rifle against a hat stand. You look a little confused. Perhaps I should explain. The decider gestured to a plush velvet chair in front of a blazing fire. Jack hesitated, then sat down. When they were both seated by the fire, the decider sipped his drink and smiled pleasantly at Jack, who looked away and began fishing plastic umbrellas out of his cocktail. How began Jack, then tried again. Did you? The revolutionaries, of course. They've been keeping me informed of all your movements since you arrived. Oh, don't pull a face like that. It was nothing personal. I asked them to. They betrayed me because you asked them to. They had no choice, I'm afraid. It's in their genes. Disobedience does not come naturally to a Theron. It's one thing to sit around and discuss an oligo-anarchist utopia, or whatever they decide on this week. 
and even to plot my overthrow. But only a one in a billion freak could disobey a direct request from the dominant leader. Cigar? Jack shrugged. Thanks. He accepted a light from the leader and took a puff. Don't hold it against them. They're a bright bunch. Should go far. I've already earmarked some important positions at the public service, especially for them. The enormity of this wrong caused Jack to drop his cigar into his lap. You're turning revolutionaries into public servants. You are still thinking from a human point of view, Commander Taylor. Initiative is a rare quality amongst the Therans. Talents like the revolutionaries are sorely needed in my government. The decider got up to freshen Jack's drink. As he dropped a curly straw into the oversized glass, he added, I only wish they were a little more disobedient. What do you mean? Think about it. Just because I can give orders doesn't mean I like doing it. Therans like myself are rare, but there are a few of us. Beings like Greffa and Alba are too rare to be left in some small revolutionary cell. We have to seek them out and get them into the government as quickly as possible. The rest of us could always use some rest. But what about the behavior testing centers? I've seen citizens taken away by the secret police. The decider smiled and made his way over to a door on the far side of the room. If you'd care to follow me. The decider led Jack into a room in which sat two Therans, one wearing yellow pants and slippers. Aha! Jack cried. They've been brainwashing you, haven't they? The Theron looked slightly confused. Well, sure, uh, I guess. In between the Continental Breakfast and the Game of Coits, there could have been some brainwashing. And those trust exercises, sometimes I thought I was being brainwashed there. They must have subjected you to countless torture sessions to break your spirit. Well, I wouldn't call the team-building workshop a torture session exactly, but I see your point, the Theron said. He yawned loudly and began scratching. Did they show you horrible films with subliminal messages? Well, I don't know about those messages, but one of the romantic comedies was pretty damn horrible, all right. The Theron <laughs> chuckled. Who meets their life mate in a supermarket? Have they manipulated your opinion of the decider at all? Jack demanded. Hmm, well, before we went, I thought he was pretty good. But at one of the meals, the tartar sauce tasted funny. What kind of a decidership is this where you can't even get a decent sachet of tartar sauce? Still, nobody's perfect. The decider led Jack back to his study. The testing centers aren't a method of weeding out dissenters. On the contrary, we want to find more free thinkers. I don't know who made us, Jack. It wasn't the Belshadri, and it certainly wasn't humans. But whoever it was that bioengineered our race made sure it is in our genes to obey orders. We can change that. We appreciate your Earth tourist dollars. They're helping to fund our research. As we learn more about genetics, we'll be able to bring independence to ourselves. It's not the kind of thing we can trust to anyone else. The decider stood up. Well, he announced tiredly. I hope you've made up your mind if you're going to kill me or not, because I have a planet to run. I should end your tyranny, you know, Jack said. Even to himself, he didn't sound very convincing. It wouldn't change anything one way or the other. Another decider will have to be called back early from holidays. An inconvenience, true, but hardly a revolution. Jack dropped back in a chair. H how many of you are there? Usually about half a dozen. Occasionally a new candidate pops up. Sometimes a serving decider burns out. It's quite a strain. Hopefully our numbers will increase as our screening methods improve. The decider walked over to the door. It was nice to meet you, Jack. Make sure you check out the Great Swamp while you're in town. And leave the meddling in Theron politics to the Therans for once. The decider bobbed his head respectfully and left quietly. Jack sat by the fire a while longer, sucking purple fluid round the curves of the novelty straw. In case there were any revolutionaries watching, he didn't leave via the main doors, but instead crawled out through the ventilation shaft. He forgot about his plasma rifle.
Author's note. This story was written especially for a collection of humorous Australian science fiction, an underexplored niche if ever there was one. I enjoyed the opportunity to collaborate on this story with someone who was not only a friend, but also had some actual writing ability. Aiden is a talented and serious writer, but he needed some real help composing alien dick jokes, and I was happy to fill that gap. I would definitely collaborate on a story again, especially in comedy, as the interaction really helps weed out my lamest attempts at humour. It was good fun. This story was the first collaboration for me. Working with Colin was a lot of fun. Contrary to rumours you may have heard, Colin did a lot more than just provide the alien dick jokes. The story came about because I love travelling, and I wanted to write a science fiction tourist story. The opening line, Six Planets in Nine Days, came to me, and we worked from there. We're back! Hey, that's my line! Oh, oh go, go ahead. Welcome back! No, 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 the line was we're back. Look, right here. Oh. There, now it says welcome back. I spent all night writing we're back. I knew that it had to be two words, but it was originally 212. <laughs> I had to pare it down you know, so that it could get rejected is, on Drabblecast. And I, the funny thing is that I believe you. Or maybe that's the sad thing, I should say. Anyways, yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed the story. It was good stuff. I have to admit that the alien dick joke is really what sold the story for me. Is it really, or did you just say that? <laughs> I'm serious. That thing made me laugh out loud when I read that the first time. And when I did that, I figured, okay, this is a story we're, we're going to have to try. I don't know how successful we were in portraying the comedy of this story. I hope we were. I hope people found it funny and enjoyed it as much as I did. But I really thought that was a funny story. I really enjoyed those two goofy alien uh, guys who pretend to be revolutionaries, but they're really just a bunch of dopes that are doing their thing. A lot like you and I, I guess. <laughs> they're kind of like the Fred and George Weasley of aliens. It was a fun story. I, I enjoyed that one a lot. I don't know if you got this vibe, too. Normally, there's a couple of things that will right away exclude a story from consideration on our show. Because I just don't want to have to deal with the baggage that'll come along with doing a story like this. So if a story is overtly religious or anti-religious... I will right away want to say, no, I'm sorry. That's just not a battle arena that I want to step into. You know, it doesn't matter who sends us the story, even if it's one of our very favorite authors, I still am going to say, no, no thanks. And then the other of those two is a story that is very political. It seems to me like this story does have political underpinnings to it. It seems like it's kind of an allegory of the U.S. invasion of Iraq. They've gone in there, and now we're, we're trying to help these people be democratic instead of living their standard form of government, which is terrorizing evil dictator, telling everybody what to do. But, you know, they like it that way because at least the stoplights work when the dictator is in charge because if they don't work, then he sends that person off and shoots them. And yeah, you know, the, the this story is all about, again, another person who's trying to meddle in the affairs of these aliens. And aliens manage to convince him that it's not his place. He needs to stay out of their affairs and, you know, let the aliens figure out what course they need to take. And, you know, they're happy to have been freed from their previous oppressors, but they don't need new oppressors in place of those. So I suppose this is a fairly political story. Usually I try to avoid that kind of stuff, but... You know, what's weird is... I couldn't help it. I don't think I got any of that at all. Really? And and you I'm... just laughed at the dick joke? Either I'm ridiculously dense, <laughs> or... You are. You are? I got the comedy. Uh-huh. And because the main character is the meddler, I identified with him and the rest were aliens. That's funny that, yeah, I didn't see that in there at all. Did you see District 9? By any I chance? haven't seen it yet, no. Well, in, in that, it's rather overt that the aliens represent a segment of society. But because they're aliens, you can sort of put aside any political or racial feelings that you have, or at least I was able to, and just say, well, okay, they're aliens. And I think that's something that 
Roddenberry learned when he did Star Trek is that you could mask some kind of political or some hot button issue in a bumpy forehead or a, <laughs> a, a funny sounding alien or pointy ears and a bad haircut and that people would maybe get the point that you were making, but be able to shrug it off, be able to accept it, be able to swallow the the message you're the message you're you're, you're spooning out because it has pointy ears or because it has a futuristic alien veneer on it. Interesting. I haven't written a lot of science fiction and coming up with an alien society and their culture and their mentality and, and the social economic hierarchy and how their government works and how their technology works and all that stuff seems like a, an incredibly daunting task. If you were writing a novel or a series of novels, boy, I, I, you could probably just write page after page after page a backstory or history or, or, or some kind of, of a Bible for your alien world or your species and all that stuff. And, and frankly, that's more work than I'm usually willing to put in. <laughs> so I think it's really neat when you read something and, well, to bring it closer to home, your friend, Abby, uh, has all this detailed minutia in mind of her animal Panamandora world. Right. And she knows, you know, how long the gestation period is and for, for the dog people and the, and the cat people. And she knows where their taste buds are located and all sorts of things about the, how the cerebral cortex works on the shelves. And then I just like, wow, that's amazing. But, you know, I honestly have never had to create that sort of thing. And, and I guess when all you write about is serial killers and ghosts, you don't have to. I, yeah, it, it is simpler to do a story that's set in the real world, the modern day, that does make things a lot easier. But yeah, this world that Colin and Aiden created is, is really interesting. That's one thing that I really like when you come across... And this is just a short story, so I'm sure that they probably still had to do a lot of that stuff. But yeah, the, the whole idea of these aliens that basically just live to please and they can't just make decisions on their own. They need some, you know, it's just something I've not heard before. It's a new novel set of aliens and they don't really go into detail of what they look like or that kind of aspect of the aliens. They more talk a lot about, you know, what the society is like and that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, it's really cool when you come across something like that where they've thought up a society and we can see just what the problems are within this society. It's just it's interesting stuff. That's going back to Abigail Hilton, your friend. Oh wait, my friend, Abigail Hilton. I don't know if there are other worlds out there similar to Panamandora. It's a new novel concept and that's what really makes it uh, interesting to me. If it was just another fantasy world, and here live the dwarves in their mountain caves, and in the forests are the elves, the sprites, and the, you know, I don't, you know, that crap has been so overdone that I just don't care. But you come up with a different world, and yeah, it's, it's really cool. And that's one of the great things about science fiction. There's not a tolkien pattern that you have to fit your story into to get the community to embrace it you can come up with all your own world and you know the same author can keep adding new worlds to the same universe too so you could take the Therans and then come up with another planet full of other kinds of aliens and put them together and pretty soon you've got a cantina full of unusual aliens that do their thing a, a long time ago, I made the mistake of mentioning a double-edged sword. Developing an alien civilization and history and, and, and personality and stuff can be a double-edged sword when their mystique starts to disappear, when they cease being scary, when they cease being threatening, when you realize that they're just like us. And, you know, Star Trek did that a lot where the big bad guys were the Klingons and then Ron Moore and, and Michael Dorn come along and suddenly we find out that the Klingons are all right. Yeah. And, and then they've got all sorts of tradition and, and personality and stuff. And we like the Klingons, but, but you know what? Here come the Borg and those suckers are alien, man. We don't know nothing about the, oh my gosh, here they come. And then 
we bring back the Borg again and again and again. We have Star Trek Voyager and we get to know the Borg. And you know what? They're just like us. <laughs> and you know where I'm going with this. What's the best example ever for the big, scary alien enemy? And then we get to know them and they're oh. just like us. The one that I think of is the Cylons, of course, who were extremely scary when Battlestar Galactica began. And they were unknowable. Yeah, and then uh, they decided to start doing episodes on board a Cylon base ship. Pretty soon, who cares? The Cylons are one of us, and and, then suddenly all the main characters of the show turns out are Cylons, and that was an unfortunate loss. And, you know, that had to have been... A decision that they made and let's humanize the Cylons and let's get to know them and let's develop some that we like and some that we hate and have squabbling in between them. But they had to sacrifice the mystery and the scariness yeah. and the, there's that word again, alienness of the Cylons. You know, that, that's something that people have talked about, that the sci-fi writers, the scientists, that everybody but theologians have talked about for years and years and years is if we ever actually encountered aliens, we can't even imagine what they would be like. Everything for us is funneled through human understanding and human behavior and human observation of the animal world. And we project that on everything and we project that on the dog and we project that on the birds and we project that on the effing robot that won't edit out the stupid things that I say. <laughs> but if we ran into these aliens who grew up in, under a different sun and with different traditions and beliefs and biology, I mean, how could we even communicate with them? I just, I just hope that they're hot. That's all I really... <laughs> Yeah. I think Rish is right. We don't do a lot of sci-fi on the show, do we? Maybe, we do our share. Maybe it's because I run screaming from science fiction. I don't and think so. I think it's, I mean, it's not like we're doing space opera every week or something like that. But a lot of the stuff that we do is still be considered sci-fi. I guess I said before that I read a lot of science fiction, and that's a lie. That's a bold face. Is it bold or bald? It's bald. It's a balls face lie. And I don't know if we'll ever have the opportunity to talk about aliens again. And so that's why I wanted to talk a little bit about the unknowingness and, and, and the alien. The, yes. And like the, the xenomorphs, as they're called, in the, the Fox alien series. I mean, you can call it the Ridley Scott alien, whatever you want to call this thing. That has remained really alien, but it's basically they just took a bug, an insect, and sort of made it really, really big. And the life cycle of an insect is creepy to us. It's it's disturbing. It's, it's, it's wrong. You know, nobody likes bugs. They, so they've kept those guys fairly scary, but nothing can compare to that first 1979 alien film for how scary that creature was. Yeah. And part of it was just they kept it in the dark all the time. And the other part was, well, we didn't know what it wanted, or uh, there was no way to communicate with it. And it was just evil, you know? And James Cameron comes along in the next movie, and when that queen freaks out because Ripley is killing its children, there suddenly becomes a line that gets crossed where it is not so alien anymore, and we understand why that alien is, is so upset and why it wants to kill Ripley. I, you know, I, I love aliens, but it's just the more you explore it, it, the less alien they become. You know, it was like that with all the slasher movie icons in the 80s and stuff, you know, with Jason and Michael Myers and Freddy and Chucky and <laughs> Pinhead and Needle Dick and say more words, I know. <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean? That They first come on, on the scene and they're just scary as hell and we don't know. And what does it want and why is it there and how did it get there? And especially Freddy. He just scared the pee out of me as a kid in that first movie. And then we give him a sense of humor and we give him all the funny lines and suddenly he becomes the hero of the movie and you get to find out his backstory and you get to see him before he was the dream killer and you get to liking him and pitying him or whatever it is and and then you get to see him fight jason in his own freddy versus jason movie yeah that you did that and, and you know they've remade elm street and that's coming out next year and all of these horror remakes they always have to tell you why 
and explain where it came from and how did the Amityville house get so scary and how did Michael Myers become the serial killer that was terrifying in movie after movie because you didn't know that he was abused as a kid. He was just a poor innocent boy who struck back at a world that was unfair to him and <laughs> and I, I know that this is a tangent but it all goes back to just the alienness, the scariness of not knowing something. Yeah. It's hard as a storyteller to be able to get away with that alienness and unknowing. It does make things scary, but so many times you get to the end of the story and people just start complaining. They're like, well, why the hell did all this happen? Why are these aliens attacking our world and blowing things up? Why do they do what they do? And people are upset if some sort of explanation isn't given. You know, I have to admit that sometimes that just makes it better that you never find out. I think Big is right. Although I have to admit that there has been times that I've read stories and thought, eh, I never tell you what the point of all this was. It's a double-edged sword, I guess. <laughs> You're mocking me, aren't you? Oh, no. No, 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 no. Rish, look, an alien. I would never do such a thing. Ah, good, good. So, interesting thing about this story is that the, for the first time, we have a story that's written by two people, not just one. Oh, shoot. Yeah, they're totally right. We had a double author's sword. note. Yeah, not double-edged sword. A double author's note today. That's really cool. I, I think I've asked you before, but have you ever collaborated with someone on an entire story and finished it? Did yes you? and no. I've, I've collaborated on screenplays. Oh. And for me, that's easier. Oh, okay. Writing has always been a very personal, private thing for me. For everybody. Writing is, is very rarely done by committee or in a big group. or I mean, it's usually done by yourself in some quiet room where it's just your thoughts, your creativity, and your sweat. And I've always felt that collaborating with someone else when you're on the same wavelength would just be great because the second I get tired or frustrated or stuck, the next person can take off and, and write and continue and we'll help each other and we'll lift each other up. And, and he's not heavy. He's my brother. And in reality, it's never really worked like that for me. Either one of us loses interest and the other says, oh, okay, well, this becomes my story, which has happened many times. Or uh, you, you disagree with each other on something and it just derails and doesn't continue. I think it's great that these two guys created this story together. And I, I don't know who did the majority of the work and who did the co-writer kind of stuff. But it doesn't matter. I mean, forever it's their stuff. It's their right. together. I don't know. Do you think it's possible to just split something 50-50? How would you do that? I don't know. We've discussed it a few times. We've considered collaborating together and uh, never gotten anywhere with it. And why, why do you suppose that is? How we can't manage to write our own stories, much less stories together, mostly just because we're lazy and lame. You said it, Big. I think you said last year and again this year we probably repeated that same thing, saying, yeah, we'll go up to your dad's cabin and we'll take a weekend there and we'll stay up late and plan out a collaboration. Of course, we never did that. Maybe someday it'll happen because I think we have different styles, but I think our styles put together would turn out good. It would be something that I couldn't write and something that you couldn't write. Right. What it was, or at least last year, was we were going to collaborate on a Christmas story oh, yeah. for the show. That's right. And yeah. I, but that one kind of died just because we eventually realized that that was a screenplay and not a uh, written story that all the jokes that we'd come up with for that story were all visual jokes and wouldn't work so well on the written page. But yeah, we really ought to try it sometime, I think. I think it would be cool. If anybody is out there listening that has had a positive experience... No, you, one's, you know what? no one's out there listening at all, much less someone has had a positive experience. Oh. Sorry, go on. All right, T, can you play the sad music, please? <laughs> if you've had a, a bad experience or a positive one, how did it work? How do you collaborate with somebody? I, I'm thinking that probably the best experiences I've had was when there is a mastermind, an executive producer type person who's in the room with you developing ideas and saying this is going to happen and then this is the, and this and then they send you off to do the work. Those are the collaborations I think that have worked the best for me. But is that entirely a collaboration? Because <laughs> I would hope 
the my name was on that script because I wrote it. I, maybe we can have a story by credit for the other people. I, I don't know. It is the whole credit thing has always been really frustrating. And the, who came up with what? And maybe it's best that you never answer that question. Right. Because people feel protective. I, I certainly feel really protective about the stuff that I've written. I've never noticed and, that. No way. I don't know. I've, I've said countless times on the show. I've said in this episode that it's hard work to write. Yeah. And the people that want to step in there and claim the work was done by them and it wasn't. It's just always really frustrating. Your point is? Okay. One of the writers, uh, it was Aiden, said that he went to Clarion Cell. Mm-hmm. You know, I wasn't really aware of what went on at Clarion. A lot of um, blanket parties, I've heard. <laughs> But I guess it's a place where you go for weeks. I mean, it might be six weeks and you're just in a writing environment and you're given instructions and given assignments and constantly sharing your work with others and critiquing other people's work and listening to people talk and practicing and working. And it sounds great, except for the six weeks part. For me. <laughs> if there was such a thing as like a seven day writer's retreat and you and I went and we were stuck somewhere and we had to write our own crap and we had to collaborate and we had to write a whole finished work together. <laughs> I would love to try that. I would uh -huh. love to be in the room with both of us, maybe alternating who's typing <laughs> and we're just talking through it and then this happens and I think the line would be this and I don't know, what if he says this? And we just go through the whole thing but outside of that scenario, which is as much a science fiction scenario as <laughs> the aliens, I just, I don't think that you and I can ever successfully collaborate. Well, people manage to do it all the time somehow. For example, one of the series of books that I used to love when I was growing up was uh, the Dragonlance books by uh, Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. I don't know how they managed to do it, but I'm sure it's possible that we could do it outside of a science fiction scenario where we are sequestered in an alien spaceship with nothing to do but collaborate on a story. And the aliens say if we don't have a story written by both of us, they will use their probes on us within a week. And I purposely <laughs> slack off at the last minute. <laughs> Colin and Aiden managed to do it. I don't know how they did it and what, what their method was. And I've often wondered about that. I've only collaborated really one time, and it didn't really get very far. M my friend who I was collaborating with did most of the work, and each time he would send me stuff, it was different than I remembered us talking about things being, and so I was confused and didn't know what to do, and then we eh, finally just fizzled. So it didn't work out for me that way, but maybe someday we will go to your dad's cabin and talk over a story and put it together. I really think that our two styles could go together well and would really come out with something nice. Back on topic, guys. Yeah, so if you've got any suggestions for us, because, you know, we, we really need the help, or any tactics for other listeners, leave a comment on the blog about what process you've used in the past that's worked or didn't work for you in the, in the collaboration. We'd love to hear it. And we'd also love to hear any uh, alien dick jokes that you may have. <laughs> right. <laughs> so anyways, the other day, um, I was looking at our comments on the webpage, uh -huh. and somebody was suggesting... That because the people who comment on our website... Are the same people week after week after week? No, because the people that comment on there make such wise and thoughtful and interesting comments, they thought that we ought to put together a forum. Big, were you this commenter? <laughs> I actually wasn't, oh. interestingly enough. What do you think? Do you think that that's something that we ought to consider? I don't know. Normally I would say no, that nobody cares. <laughs> but that true. episode... Um, Origin of Sounds had like 20 comments in one weekend or 25 or some yeah. crazy number like that. And only Way 16 of them were me. Really enjoyed reading the comments. And I know you do too. I don't know about forums though. Yeah, it seems like it might be a lot of work. I don't know if it would be worth it. Uh, I don't even know what's involved in putting together a forum to tell you the truth. Well, hey, maybe we should record something. Say, like now? All right. We'll take the opportunity right now to ask anybody out there who's listening. First of all, do you guys think it would be worth it for us to have forums? Is this something you want? Would you go to the forums and comment on them? Or would they languish there and you go onto the page and little pixelated tumbleweeds would just roll past and a sad, lonely wind would blow? That, or, that's how I live each day. Oh, cool. 
And I wonder, are there people who would comment on a forum but are hesitant to just add theirs to a long string of comments? With forums, you can make new threads about separate things. And we're always asking these questions to each other and then to the audience. And we could just do that on a forum if we had one. But at the same time, dude, I don't know how to do it. And you said you didn't know how to do it. What was the second part of your question? Uh, Is there anybody who knows how to make forums and wants to do one for the Dune Steve? I mean, I I hate to ask people to work for free or whatever, but I guess it's not like we have money to pay them with. Press the button. I mean, that's the other thing that you need when you have forums. you got to have, like, moderators that are always checking stuff out and, like, deleting the spam comments, deleting the nasty personal attacks and all that kind of crap that always goes on when you get a forum going online. Enough positive comments from you, Nigel. So, yeah, is there somebody who would be willing to be a moderator and, and, and work on that? If you think a forum would be worthwhile and you would want to be a moderator or whatever, send us an email, editor at dunesteep.com, and, and let us know that you'd be interested, and, and we'll think about it. You know, and it might be as easy as a template, like blogs are. You know how you can right. have templates, and they're Probably all blogs? Um, and if so, I still don't want to do it. But I want somebody to tell me <laughs> it's so easy that I could do it, so I can say deal. Nice. Uh, I guess that's our show for today. Yeah, I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And, you know, we'd, we'd better get back, because it'll be dark soon. And they mostly come at night. Mostly. At the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, we pay our authors. So if you love good fiction and want to see it continue, please donate. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Take two. You look... You... Oh, crap. At first, it sounded like it was the James Bond villain kind of voice, which I thought was really cool. But then it started to sound a little bit more like Santa Claus. So either of those is fine. <laughs> but, it, but either way, it sounded like a heavy set gun. Uh huh. You look a little confused. That's a little. Uh, off, let's let's either do close. Santa Claus or a Bond villain. That's... <laughs> ho ho ho! <laughs> you look a little confused. Perhaps I should explain. <laughs> <laughs> horror at the things I've written. You really are the oldest 35-year-old anybody knows. Put her there, pal. How dare you laugh at me. Let me think of something a little no. more contemporary. It's supposed to be cheesy and stupid. All right. Do it.